In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate the respiratory circulatory exam. This is a form of screening osteopathic structural exam that is useful for assessing for the presence of any restrictions that may affect breathing or circulation. As I go through this demonstration, I'm going to be uh, putting my hands in a few different areas from your head, shoulders, along your rib cage, the front and back of your pelvis, also along your knees and ankles. If you feel any discomfort, if uh, there's any pain, if you feel uncomfortable, if you, mean, if you need me to stop or change what I'm doing, please let me know. Is it okay if I begin? Yes. All right. So we're going to begin with our patient in a supine position. Go ahead and lie down. So now with our patient in a supine position, we're going to uh, assess their breathing. So go ahead and take some big breaths in and out. So as they're breathing in and out, we're going to be assessing for the rate and rhythm of their breathing. We're also going to be assessing the uh, inspiratory expiratory ratio and a normal ratio would be one to two or one to three. And once we've assessed that ratio, we can then shift our attention to the motion of the costal cage. We can look at anterior posterior expansion. We can also try to observe for any lateral expansion. We can also observe chest rise and also the rise of the abdomen from the xiphoid all the way down to the pubic symphysis. We can then move and assess lumbar curvature. I'm gonna move your hand right here. We can take our hand and either uh, in a supinated or pronated position, we're going to place our contact against the table and then push down on the table and then slide our hand under their lumbar spine with our fingertips along the spinous processes. And then in this position, we can assess for normal motion of the lumbar spine during inhalation and exhalation. So during inhalation, we'd expect the lumbar spine to flatten as the lumbar spine flexes. And during exhalation, we'd expect the lumbar spine to enter more of a lower dosis as the lumbar spine extends. We can also assess for any excess or absence of lumbar lordosis as that may affect diaphragm motion due to the crural attachments on the lumbar vertebra. We can then move to assess for signs of passive congestion at our sites of terminal lymphatic drainage. Now this can be integrated into the rest of our physical examination when we're assessing for peripheral edema, but we're going to start at the lower extremities and then work our way uh, more proximal. So I'm going to be putting my hands along your uh, ankles and lower legs. I'm going to be feeling for any swelling down there. I'm going to lift the bottom of your pants up if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay. So ideally, whenever possible, we want to palpate directly on skin. So first, we're going to start with the lower leg, and we can inspect the foot and ankle, any exposed area for any obvious signs of edema, and then we can palpate in the Achilles area for any signs of tissue congestion. And we're going to assess the right side here. And then we're going to move up to the popliteal fossa bilaterally. Starting with this left side, we're going to take our hands and move behind the knee. And then we're going to curl our fingers into the popliteal fossa between the insertions of the hamstrings and the gastroc. And we're going to assess for any sign of tissue congestion. Checking this right side as well. And our next area is going to be the inguinal region. Because this is a sensitive area, we want to make sure that we're clear with our patient before we approach and make contact. So I'm going to be feeling for any swelling in the front of your pelvis, and I'm going to be feeling specifically the region that's between uh, the front of these bones here in the front of your hips, um, between that and your pubic bone, which is uh, in front of your bladder. So somewhere between that, where your thigh meets your pelvis is where I'm going to be uh, pushing, okay? Okay. So we can start with contacting the ASIases and then follow inferior and medial until we find our femoral triangle. Now if we're unsure of our contacts and we want to confirm our anatomy, we can ask our patient to enhance that femoral triangle by putting their leg into a figure four position. So I'm just going to move your leg up this way and just relax your leg. And I'm gonna to be touching at the top of your thigh uh, where it meets your pelvis, okay. okay? So moving from inferior to the ASIS medial, you can find where the femoral triangle is enhanced by the muscles as they're stretched in this position. 
So from there, we can move to the sub-xiphoid area. I'd like you to put your hands right here. So we can assess immediately inferior to the xiphoid, and we're going to assess for any congestion uh, that may be at the level of the cisterna chile. Then we can shift our attention to the upper extremities, and we're going to start from the carpal tunnel bilaterally. So we can assess right across the wrist for any signs of tissue congestion. We're going to assess this right side as well. And we're going to check the antecubital fossa. Now I like to keep a little bit of elbow flexion so that I can feel the space created by the muscles there. And check the right side. Good. And now we're going to move proximally to the axilla. And again, because this is a sensitive area, we're going to want to be clear with our patient on where our contacts are going to be. I'm going to be putting my fingers uh, along the side of your ribs up into your armpits. Okay. I'd like you to keep your hands right here on your pelvis and just shift your elbows to the side. Okay. Good. So now approaching the axilla, we're going to take the medial aspect of our hands. We're going to find the mid-axillary line at the inferior margin of the ribs, and then we're going to track superiorly along that mid-axillary line until we reach the axilla. We're going to reach all the way up into the axilla and then appreciate any tissue congestion that may be present. Now, for patients who may have larger uh, breast tissue, which may be unsupported if they're not wearing a bra or if they're in the hospital setting, we're going to modify our approach by pronating our uh, wrists a little bit more, and we're going to first reach down to the table, and then we're going to sweep behind, find the inferior margin of the rib cage with our lateral aspect of our hands, and then we can supinate our hands so that we can again reach that mid axillary line. And then from there, we can slowly approach the axilla to assess for any congestion. So now from here, I'm going to move to the supraclavicular area. I'm going to sit at the head of the table and I'm going to feel immediately posterior to the clavicles for any tissue congestion. And then I'm going to move superiorly to the suboccipital area and appreciate for any soft tissue congestion. So now that we've assessed the sites of terminal lymphatic drainage, we're going to shift our attention to assessing the central lymphatic pathways. And we're going to do that by assessing for motion uh, at each of the junctions. So we're going to start at the craniocervical junction. We're going to cradle the head and upper cervical spine. And our uh, fingers are going to be uh, monitoring at the craniocervical junction. And then we're going to add some gentle rotation to the left and then to the right. And this is a very small rotation as we're testing just the motion at the craniocervical junction. This motion is also not purely an articular motion. It's more of a fascial tension that we're assessing. So rotation to the left, I'm feeling some resistance. And then with rotation to the right, I feel a little bit of a freedom of motion. So I'm going to note that uh, the craniocervical junction is rotated to the right. Now I'm going to shift down to the cervical thoracic junction. So now I'm going to take a contact that is similar to my contact for thoracic inlet. I'm going to have my hands across the shoulder girdle with my index fingers immediately posterior to the clavicle and my middle and ring fingers immediately inferior to the clavicle. And my thumbs are going to reach posteriorly uh, to the level of T1. And then from here, I'm going to induce rotation by lifting from posterior to anterior and guiding into rotation. So I'm lifting in rotation to the left, lifting in rotation to the right. And I'm feeling a resistance in rotation to the right and a freedom of motion in rotation to the left. So, so far my craniocervical junction has a freedom in rotation to the right and my cervical thoracic junction has a freedom in rotation to the left. Now I'm going to assess the thoracolumbar region by uh, making a contact on the posterior attachments of the diaphragm. I'm going to start by finding the inferior margin of the ribs, and then I'm going to take my fingers and move posteriorly back by where I would expect to feel ribs 11 and 12. And then from here, I'm going to induce rotation at that thoracolumbar region by lifting from each side. So here I'm rotating to the right, and here I'm rotating to the left. And what I'm feeling, I'm feeling some resistance when I rotate to the right, and I'm feeling a freedom of motion when I'm rotating to the left. In the instance where we're not able to make a more posterior contact, or if our patient is wider, or if our table is wider and we have to cover more distance, 
we can also make a more lateral contact. Again, making a more lateral contact on the rib cage. We can allow our thumbs to move more anterior. And then from here, we're going to emphasize our rotation again by lifting from posterior to anterior and appreciate any rotation that we feel. And again, I confirm that I'm feeling some resistance with rotation to the right and freedom of motion with rotation to the left. So then we have our cranial cervical junction that is rotated to the right, our cervical thoracic junction that's rotated to the left, and our thoracolumbar junction, which is rotated to the left. Now shifting down to the lumbosacral region, we're gonna to wanna to make contact on the posterior pelvis. I'm gonna be putting my hands on the back of your pelvis and uh, shifting you from side to side, okay? Okay. And we're gonna put your hands right here. So now here, approaching the pelvis, we're gonna take our thenar eminences and we're gonna find the lateral aspect of the ASIs. We're gonna take our index and middle fingers and follow along the iliac crest posteriorly. And then we're gonna take our hands and follow the iliac crest until we reach just about where we would find the posterior superior iliac spines. And then from there, we can induce rotation by gently lifting on one side and then the other, inducing rotation to the right and rotation to the left. And here I'm feeling resistance and restriction in rotation to the right and a freedom of motion in rotation to the left. Again, in an instance where I may not have as easy access to make a more posterior contact, I can make a more lateral contact. Again, finding the ASIs and then allowing my fingers to follow along the iliac crest. And then from here, my rotation again, I'm inducing by lifting the innominate on one side and then the other to try to induce rotation at the lumbosacral junction. I'm not going to be pushing on the ASIs as, as I would for an ASIs compression test. Instead, I'm lifting from posterior to anterior to induce some rotation more centrally and more posterior, I'm trying to appreciate the fascial tension in that area. So here again, I'm finding resistance and restriction in rotation to the right and freedom of motion in rotation to the left. So I have a pattern that is cranial cervical junction, rotation to the right, cervical thoracic junction, rotation to the left, thoracolumbar junction, rotation to the left, and lumbosacral junction, rotation to the left. So that would be an uncompensated pattern. For a compensated pattern, I would expect alternating rotations. So an example of a compensated pattern would be cranial cervical junction rotated to the left, cervical thoracic junction rotated to the right, thoracolumbar junction rotated to the left, and lumbosacral junction rotated to the right.